Hey everyone, we're here with Amber Tiemann and she is actually gonna a answer today's three questions. You gotta do the fat, Amber. Okay, Amber is here today and uh, she has to go through the, my awesome soundboard stuff. And I asked her, and Amber is like a very good friend of mine. She's actually on the Innovators Mindset podcast as well. And she is an incredible leader and administrator. Everybody, Amber Tiemann. <laughs> Do you like that music? Hey, so I was just actually telling Amber, like these three questions, one of the questions I ask is like, who is a teacher that inspired you? And I actually did this at first. And what was really cool is that I talked about three teachers and they all commented to me, one sent me a DM and two comments on the YouTube link. So it's kind of cool. So Amber, first question, who is a teacher that inspired you and why? All right. So I would go with my first grade teacher. Her name is Mrs. Houston, um, elementary school. And I don't know that I could even specify what she did during my year, but I will never forget that several years later, my little brother had her as well. And she came to one of his flag football games on the weekend. And at some point he broke away, ran for a touchdown and she ran the entire field with him, awesome. just cheering and screaming, tripped in a hole, broke or sprained, did something <laughs> to her ankle where she had to like be on crutches moving forward, um, but she didn't even care. She was so excited because he'd scored a touchdown. And I just remember thinking, that's the kind of teacher I want to be. Like all in, yelling so loud and crazy on a weekend, cheering for not only a current student, but a former student sibling. And it was just, I, I will never, ever forget Mrs. Houston doing that. I, I recently found her on Facebook. And so that's been really fun to, to reconnect. And I don't know that she she remembered once I told her the story, because I guess you remember when you break bones. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it kind of sticks with you. Uh, she, is, she is still in education. And so that was a really fun connection to, to make sure she knew that how, how highly I thought of her because of that. You know, you know, like I, I love about that is like, I used to go to my kids and it's, you know, obviously this is different in Texas. Like I used to go to my kids, students, uh, hockey games. Right. And I used to go to their hockey games and cheer them on. It was like made such a big deal, but I didn't do it to like, it's like not a fake thing, right? I didn't just go because, you know, as a teacher, but you do it because you're genuinely invested and you want these kids to do well. And it's just such an awesome, um, you know, example of like how much teachers get into this work to make that difference. So shout out Mrs. Houston. <laughs> All right. Okay. Second question. Administrator. I know, first of all, Amber, I have known you for years. I actually met you and your assistant principal. I've watched your career, your principal, uh, your central office. And I know personally from your work and watching you grow over time that a lot of people would answer this question with you. They would talk about how inspiring you are. And uh, I've connected with a lot of your teachers and the impact that you've had. And so I know that you have mentored and helped a lot of people, but I know along the way that you've seen great administrators. So like, what, who is someone that like stuck out to you as an administrator and why? I think now that I have, have transitioned out of the principalship, um, I would say that the, the principal I had when, when we first connected was James Howard and he um, hired me as an assistant principal and um, I was eight months pregnant and he did not let that slow him down <laughs> to use me to run alongside him, uh, which is awesome. Cause I appreciated it. Uh, but he also never, ever once made me feel as if I was anything less than a building leader. Mm -hmm. And I, I worked really hard with the administrators that I worked with past that to make sure that none of them ever felt as if they were regulated to a lesser role than me. Uh, but James made sure that I was included in every conversation, every tough situation, every decision that had to be made. Ultimately, he obviously ran the building, um, but he never did it by himself. And he never made me feel as if I had a lesser of an opinion just because of my position or title. And I just now see the value. There are people who interviewed for principals back when I was an assistant principal and never got a shot. And I, I think in part, it's because they couldn't speak to a human resources situation, a budget concern, mm -hmm. um, um, a complicated parent relationship or a dispute amongst staff members. And I got to have my hands in every single one of those in practice. So when I had to answer a question, I had specifics. I had what had worked for us, what hadn't worked for us. Um, and I just really respected the fact that he treated me as an equal and never made me feel subpar 
just because he was the principal and I was the assistant principal. And, and hopefully, again, my assistant principal promoted a principal behind me. And I think a large part of that was because she could answer all the questions and can do all the things. So I'm, I'm just actually, I, like, I absolutely love that. And when, I, when you're talking about that and I'm thinking about kind of that process, do you think it was also part of the, that your, your principal did that because it was part of your personality that you knew at some point you'd maybe want to be a principal? Because I think sometimes, and I'm not saying this is a negative thing, is that some people just don't want to get there. They want to be assistant principal and that's where they see they're in their career. And so I think part of it too is they probably saw that in you as well and wanted to make sure that when you go to that next stage, whereas on the other side, I know we have both seen this, where sometimes a principal, no matter your ambition, would actually not want you doing those things because there's like an ego thing. Like, have you seen that before? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah. and I think again, your position always precedes your person. And if you can't ever let your title go in order to impact people, then you're not going to grow people around you. And that that is a testimony of how he raised me up to the way that I wanted to raise people up. It was never a taking for granted that I am here and you are here and this is how I'm going to talk to you and how I'm going to work with you. It's always been a, what next? What can I, and again, it's, that's a lot of it's from you, George. Um, how do I get you from your point A to your point B? Mm -hmm. My point B might look different, but I want to make sure that I'm supportive of you. I didn't walk into the assistant principalship knowing that I wanted to immediately be a principal and, and definitely didn't feel as if I had the skill set or the knowledge base to take that on. In fact, I even remember asking him, he was grilling hamburgers out back. And I asked, how am I going to know at school? Not like at our house. Um, I asked him, how am I going to know when I'm ready? And he said, when you start to see every decision as something you would have done differently and how you could have done it better, mm -hmm. then that's when you're going to know that you're ready to be a leader. And it's not a, here's what I'm going to do, James. What do you think? How does this go? You think that's the right move? That kind of a thing. But when you start to just be able to answer questions um, and know that that's the path that you would have taken, regardless of what my input was, that's when you, you're ready to fly. So, say that, that was that your person? What did you say? Your person precedes your. I think that the position always precedes the person. I think that your role walks into the room before you do. And, and I saw it as a building principal. I walked into a building where I didn't have any connections or any relationships when I was named principal. And that first semester, uh, if you will recall, um, my jokes were super funny and my outfits were super cute every day. I mean, I was living my best <laughs> life because everybody thought I was amazing. And, and it wasn't until I got to know right. them and they could see past my job for me to really get to know who they were, what they were scared of, what they were, um, what they were most concerned about in our building or the things that I wanted to talk about changing and where they would just nod and smile and go, okay, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, Amber. And then as soon as I left the room, would all discount that and tear it apart. But it wasn't until we got past that title business into to actually knowing my staff, which took a lot longer than I thought it would, honestly. Um, mm. But I just feel like you can't ever you don't have a cap, you, you know, you know, my old superintendent, Dr. Vincent, I do. Um, you don't have a casual, you don't have a casual conversation with the superintendent. You don't just bl blatantly throw out a hot sports opinion without him having to take action or him having to go past mm. that step. He can't ever let go of being the superintendent when he's working with people around people that he works with. I can't ever say, Oh, George was late 15 times this week. Oh, huh. just venting to my mm -hmm. friend, Dr. Vincent without that superintendent role having to step in and say, right. I, I need to follow up with George. I need to see what's going on there. And this is, and this is why we love Amber Tiemann. <laughs> Woo! All right. Last question. Okay. So one of the things that I appreciate about you, and I, I'd re I'm really curious about what you're, it's like you've taught, you've been vice principal, you've been principal, you're working in central office. Now you have these different views throughout your career. And, uh, I'm sure that if you look back on your first year of your career, you're probably a little bit embarrassed about some stuff as everyone, and I'm not saying you weren't awesome, but like you grow, right? You grow, especially you have seen um, great teachers teach. And you're like, I wish I would have done that. What? So now with all this wealth of experience in different roles, if you go back to you and tell yourself in your first year of teaching, because 2020 was like the year of the learner, everybody was a first year teacher. What would be the advice you'd give yourself? Well, I was teacher of the year my first year. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> so nothing. <laughs> so I really was. I really, I really did. Were you teacher of the year? Well, I will. Mm -hmm. Nationally? No. So there you go. You could have improved. <laughs> I could have improved. 
Um, just what I you. would say is, and again, throughout being a leader, I have learned just that just just a little humble brag there, quick. I just, just want to point out that thank mm -hmm. you, but yes, obviously everyone can, and I could even look back at my first yeah. year principal and say the same thing. I think that recognizing that your to do list will always carry over to the next day, that the relationships are going to be way more important than the content. Um, I've been very lucky to be surrounded by really, really great teachers that have modeled relationships and have modeled what it means to have strong connections with kids that, that go past being a fourth grade teacher. Um, I wish I could have told myself to enjoy where I was because I mm. was going to work my way up and out in a way. And if I had been able to appreciate the value of knowing that when it was time, it was going to work out, that I think that that would have let me be in that moment more than maybe looking at okay, then I got to finish this degree. Okay, then I got to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I got to accomplish this. And then I'm going to do this. And that way I'll be able to do that. And I, I really have focused my career in these three to five year chunks of, of what I wanted to do and accomplish. And I, again, even in this seat, am, am telling myself, enjoy where you are. Remember right. that every, every beginning is a beginning and that you get to learn and grow through it. But I've always been so focused on what's next um, that sometimes you can forget to appreciate the forest for the trees. Yeah. And it's kind of the, the idea of like, I've really worked on being present, not just being home right during this time. And, and I think that's not just a location thing. It's a, it's a mind thing too, right? Like where are you in that moment? And I remember when I was assistant principal, like I wanted to be a principal really bad and I shifted saying like, Hey, that will happen. But if I like, this is awesome right now. Like I'm, this is great. And I need to enjoy this, but I was a teacher of the year when I started. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. <laughs> Anyways, Amber, this is why you're awesome. So uh, make sure you check out uh, Amber Teeman. It's 8 Amber 8 because she loves Troy Aikman, who hasn't played in like 50 years. And we won't even talk about the Cowboys. We won't even talk about the Cowboys not making the playoffs this year. Because the Bears did. Anyways, that is oh. Oh. <laughs> three questions with Amber Tiemann. Thanks, Amber.